Now for today's program. Kati Martin is an award-winning former NPR correspondent and ABC News Bureau Chief in Germany. She is also a New York Times bestselling author whose books include Enemies of the People, My Family's Journey to America, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. She is also author of The Great Escape, Nine Jews Who Fled Hitler and Changed the World, as well as Wallenberg, The Incredible True Story of the Man Who Saved the Jews of Budapest, among many other titles. Kati's latest book is The Chancellor, The Remarkable Odyssey of Angela Merkel. Joining Kati today is Amy E. Schwartz, Moment's Opinion and Book Editor, as well as editor of the magazine's popular Ask the Rabbi section and editor of the book Can Robots Be Jewish and Other Pressing Questions of Modern Life. Before coming to Moment, Amy was a longtime editorial writer and op-ed columnist on cultural issues at the Washington Post and was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in Commentary. She has also worked at Harper's Magazine, The New Republic, and The Wilson Quarterly, and has lived in and reported from France, Germany, and Turkey. Amy is president of the Non-Denominational Jewish Study Center in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Kati Martin and Amy E. Schwartz. Thank you, everybody, for coming out this afternoon, and thank you so much, Kati, for being here to talk about the book. Um, it's, such a, it's such a pleasure to be with you, Amy, and, and, uh, and Suzanne, thanks so much for, for having me. This is, I think this is the one I was really waiting for, this, this particular Zoominar. Okay. Um, it's kind of the icing on the cake after, after many Zoom calls. This was the one I knew I would enjoy, partly because uh, of you, Amy. What, a, oh, what, thank a, you. what an incredible resume that Suzanne just uh, gave us a, a, a taste of. You, oh, have lived, you have lived a, a Merkelian life. Oh, goodness, no. I was, I was about to say the same to you. So I, I just want to say, first of all, I, I, I almost feel I should start by thanking you for writing this book, for devoting <laughs> five years to writing this book. Um, it's a fabulous book. Um, everyone should um, rush out and buy it. And um, we've just been talking about how paper shortages may delay the first reprint, so people should, should hang on and wait for it. Um, Thank you. Um, so I just, I want to start by saying, you know, um, like you, I think, and you talk about this in the book, um, I'm a, a big fan of Angela Merkel. I've watched her with amazement and, you know, it's been fascinating and thrilling to see a woman rise to the pinnacle of world power and particularly a woman like her, but it's actually been quite difficult to find out anything about her that would give you a real 3D feeling. So. I want to ask you, and you um, and you talk about this a lot in the book. I want to ask you what drew you to this difficult project, and how did you pierce the privacy zone around mm -hmm. Angela Merkel? Thank you. Well, that's really kind of you, Amy. I, I I did set out to pierce that that iron facade of hers, and this is not a book she wanted written. She doesn't want any book that 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 goes beyond what she does as chancellor. Um, and uh, and frankly, I. I wasn't uh, obsessed with what goes on in the Bundestag. In fact, I, I, I find as I speak to people that the very mention of the word Bundestag, you know, <laughs> eyes glaze over. So I avoid that. Uh, that's the last time you'll hear me mention that word. Uh, what I was interested in was precisely that. How did this triple outsider, so a woman in a male political culture, a scientist, because she was a physicist until age 35 when she jumped into politics. And from the East, which is, which is really still the poor relation of the West. How, so how did, you know, what, what was in this woman that, that enabled her to, to uh, break all those ceilings? And, uh, and of course, um, what really captured my, my absolute attention, and it's been five obsessive years, um, was was the summer of 2015 when she alone among the um, European powers opened Germany's borders for one million mostly Middle Eastern, mostly Muslim uh, refugees and uh, didn't get really didn't get help from any of her allies and uh, opprobrium uh, heaped on her and predictions that this would be the end of Merkel and the end of Germany. I mean, Henry Kissinger, her, her, her great mentor and friend, uh, said to her, you know, Angela, uh, to allow one refugee into the country is a humanitarian act, but one million 
is to destroy German culture. Well, guess what? Henry was wrong. Maybe not for the first or last Kissinger time. Kissinger the refugee said that. That's so amazing to me. Kissinger the refugee. Yes. Yes. Well, he um, he 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 strongly felt that that uh, Germany just couldn't cope with that many, not only refugees, but refugees from, from an entirely uh, different ethnicity and religion, et cetera. And, and he, he, was, he was proven wrong by, not only by Merkel, but by Germans themselves. I think, mm -hmm. I think Germans, and I know we'll get into this, but, but I think they, they have enjoyed being on the right side of history for a change. And, yes, and she, she tapped into that. She, because she's so super smart, and I know we want to talk about it just how, how uh, brilliant she is, but she understood that. She understood that, that she could, you know, that, that flat assertion of hers, wir schaffen das, we can handle this. Mm -hmm. She was right. Germany did handle it. Well, I, I'm very proud to say that Moment had a cover story about that and about her and about yes. the Germans and the refugees. And, um, but I, I wonder, can you Talk about this great mystery. What was it? How did she, what was it about her that, that made her reach that moment? Well, um, first of all, let me just say that, that she's not who we think she is. Um, again, because she doesn't want us to know who she right. is. She, she, she is that unique, I think, politician who doesn't really give a hoot what we think of her. Her, her, um, Fundamental uh, criti criticism is her own. She she is the most inner directed uh, person, not politician, regard person, human that I've ever encountered. And uh, she's as centered as an oak tree. It's quite remarkable because you know you and I have both known politicians who are the neediest and the most insecure people in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and she just I I. I she, she, this, this goes back to her, her child, her youth and childhood, which was not an easy path. She grew up in, 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 uh, in, in a remote corner of East Germany, her, uh, the daughter of a pastor, a very uh, a hard man. <laughs> he didn't strike people as a, as a man of the cloth with, with extraordinarily high standards. She never really gained his full approval. And by the way, neither of her parents ever voted for her, which I just found astonishing. That is my favorite <laughs> moment in the entire book. Yeah. It amazed me so much, the detail that um, her, mother, her mother didn't vote for her. No, but, right. but because Merkel has this remarkably controlled, non-needy uh, persona, mm -hmm. um, she, she, um, she looks past that and you know, they're my parents, I'll take them, you know, I wish, I wish I were that generous toward my parents, but anyway, um, so, so the childhood in, in commune, inside the communist zone, chosen by her father, who but he went there on purpose, right, and then got stuck, he actually volunteered to go east? Yeah, at a time when all the traffic was in the opposite direction, because by then it was clear that, that the, that the Soviet army of occupation would not be a temporary thing, which I hope the Ukrainians are not about to be reminded of again. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, the, the um, uh, West Germany was being flooded by, by refugees from the East and, and the Merkels were going in the opposite direction. By the way, Merkel, just to, I'm sure somebody uh, among our listeners will jump on me for this. Merkel was not her, her family name, Kastner was Merkel. Um, was the one and only thing she retains from her brief first marriage was was uh, the the name. Uh, but at any rate, her father, who was a, a zealous uh, Lutheran, um, answered answered the church's call to preach in the atheist state of of uh, East German People's Republic. And so she grew up. She Merkel grew up in that extremely uh, constricted environment. Where um, where Western newspapers were were forbidden. I remember, if I can just jump forward for a second, I uh, you mentioned or Suzanne mentioned that I'd been a bureau chief in Germany um, during uh, in the latter days of the Cold War, and whenever I I would cross from west where I was based to east, the the um, the border guards would would always ask any contraband alcohol, cigarettes, newspapers. Because 
because Western newspapers were deemed contraband, dangerous. So Merkel grew up in, in, in this kind of an extraordinary limited um, and, and sheltered environment where Marxism, Leninism was, was um, the, the uh, diktat of the day. And that was her only poor grade in a stellar academic career was in, was in Marxist dogma, which I think is to her, <laughs> to her so, credit. So, so she, had to rely, oh, she had to rely on herself. She, mm -hmm. she, um, she, her, her parents took with them um, a, a wonderful library of the great, great Western um, German, mostly, um, uh, tomes, you know, Thomas Mann and Schiller and Goethe and uh, Donner, you know, all, 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 the, all the greats, which, which, which she imbibed. And so she, she uh, had a lot of time by herself um, in the woods of Brandenburg province and became very self-reliant and was always first in her class. That, um, <laughs> Uh, but but again, you know, when you look at the pictures, which I have in the book of her as a as a as a student, she is doing her best not to call attention to herself. She she has always been the observer in the in any setting. She observes and learns, and you know, it's such a gift. I mean, most politicians, again, the ones that we know, are are performers. She has never mastered the performative aspects of her role. And I consider that, this is no hagiography, by the way, I hasten to add. And I, I consider one of her deficits that she never really mastered the, 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 the politician's uh, essential tool of, of performance and, and selling. She's, she's not very good at that. She has many other gifts, but that's, that's not one of them. She has a scientist's Mm -hmm. uh, powers of, of observation and and uh, and collecting evidence and caution. These were these have all proven to be priceless gifts. So if so, that helps explain why she has this inner um, balance, which might have allowed her to stand on her own and and hear sort of an internal call. What accounts do you think for her spectacular rise to power? Well, in addition to being brilliant and having a photographic memory, um, she is also extraordinarily strategic, knows how to shield her ambition, uh, knew that as a woman, um, the last thing she wanted was to be a threat to any, uh, any of her, her male uh, rivals and um, the ability to surprise people when she, this, this otherwise very cautious uh, person sees an opening and, and, and goes for it. And people are left flat-footed. And the other thing which will surprise uh, many readers is that she can be utterly ruthless when necessary. And again, not expected by a woman of such a placid sort of uh, puritanical uh, exterior that Can you give she, an example? yeah, well, she, you know, she the, the the most dramatic example is is when she she absolutely um, uh, uh, guillotined, not literally, um, her her great mentor, Hel Chancellor Helmut Kohl, who was the one who really responsible for her for her uh, meteoric ascent from scientist to a year later, uh, the youngest uh, woman cabinet minister in, in, in Cole's government. And yet when Cole was caught in a kickback scandal um, and for, for, um, for our, our audience who might be too young to recall that Cole was the Titanic, Helmut Cole was the Titanic figure responsible for the unification of East and West Germany and, and uh, you know, a great friend of, of Bill Clinton's and in every way a huge figure. And no one in the CDU, Merkel's party, the Christian Democratic Union, had the courage to say to him, Helmut, you're embarrassing us. You're caught in a scandal and we're gonna go down with you. Well, one person had the courage and that was his protege, Angela Merkel. 
who wrote this explosive op-ed read by all of Germany saying, basically, it's time to go. Hmm. In other words, she chose, first of all, the party, but above all, the country over her personal loyalty. So she is, again, breaking a stereotype of, uh, regarding women. She's not a sentimental softy. She, mm -hmm. when necessary, she can be tough as nails. I learned so much in trying to uh, decode her. Well, that's that's a segue. We can come back and talk about her accomplishments more, and um, and also about this this moral center and where it where it took her. And but um, I I do want to ask you. I mean, obviously, beyond her her importance on the global stage, there is her importance to women and oh. or as to the the. The, the status of the, the stature and status of women in politics. Um, and you, you've said, you say in the book that it's, it's among other things, a book about power. Um, what did you learn from her? Or maybe I should say, what do we learn from her yes. about how a woman can break this code that we've seen so many women fail to do? And also like, is it different? Did she do things that men wouldn't or couldn't do? Yeah, well, that 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 of course was 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 the the uh, the heart of my of my chronicle is is uh, because uh, I think the the most transformative thing that she achieved was to permanently put to rest any remaining questions about a woman's capacity to rule, and another thing, it's a different kind of leadership mm -hmm. than than a male one. Um, and different in that, Merkel always believed that hubris was a male luxury, that women have more important things to do than to worry about ego and, mm -hmm. and how they appear to others. And she really uh, unmasked the, the, um, the, 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 the silliness the, um, and the insecurity of, of, of um, macho leaders like Trump and Putin and, and the others. She, she was not blessed with her fellow, her, her cohort of fellow <laughs> leaders. She, she had a, a particularly bad bunch, I mean, uh, of, of populists from, from Erdogan to Orban to obviously n numero uno with her longest dysfunctional marriage was with Vladimir Putin and, and that is, you know, a whole a whole other saga, which I'd love for us to to broach. Since 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 Putin, in my humble opinion, is now testing the the West in the post Merkel era. I think that's partly what's going on in in Ukraine. But uh, but anyway, so but to 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 return to your question about about what it what it is that um, that that how she conquered um, how, how she uh, crack that that uh, that the glass, uh, the famous the glass ceiling, I guess you'd say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and she did it by by um, this ability to surprise and always being um, better prepared than anybody. She goes into a conference, uh, and again aided by that that remarkable brain of hers, um, better prepared than anybody. And and you know, in this very calm, she never raises her voice. She never takes the bait. You know how many times uh, Putin tried to shake her that 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 self possession of hers. Oh, tell uh, the story about the dog. Oh yes. So so the first time they met, because of course uh, Putin, being a trained KGB agent, knew very well that she was afraid of dogs having been bitten. And uh, and so what does he do? The first meeting, he unleashes his his giant black Labrador Coney, and Merkel just froze in her in her seat her staff fuming watching this Merkel no reaction um he also Putin uh, and, and, and afterwards she 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 said to her staff and they shared this with me that that you know as as a staff were saying oh my god I mean how could he do that what a what a monster she said it's all he has hmm. Russia has no economy Russia has <laughs> basically only one thing, um, fuel yeah. to sell, um, and, uh, and no future. And so it, he's a small man. 
That's quite, that's a very interesting response. You, you say in the book that they spent hundreds of hours on the phone, she and he, and that yes. because of having grown up in, in the Soviet uh, zone, she of course spoke Russian and had all these, really had his, had his number. Totally. And he just, he, she was the only head of state and how we miss her now, mm. whom he really respected. And, and they literally speak each other's languages. As you said, um, she, she speaks Russian, but he speaks fluent German. Mm. And I once had the chance to ask her, what, do you, what, what language do you use now after all these years? And she said, now German, uh, because his German is so good and my, my, uh, my Russian has gotten rusty. But he spent uh, years as a KGB agent in Dresden. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I quote him as saying then that um, the enemy was NATO. And the enemy, of course, is still NATO for him. So for, for Putin, even though he grew up uh, in, this, in, the, in the same school, as it were, as she did, uh, the Marxist-Leninist school, uh, he came away with the opposite conclusion. For him, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the great catastrophe of the 20th century, a catastrophe he wanted to make right, which is what he's still doing. And with Merkel, he just couldn't get away with that. And so he, he, um, he, the respect he has for her, uh, you know, regardless of whether she represents the enemy, as she does in his mind, um, was, uh, was real. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, when, when he first invaded uh, Ukraine in 2014, um, and uh, in those days, um, President Obama was, of course, the, you know, the, the nominal leader of the West, such as it was. And so it was his job, really, to, to, um, to negotiate on behalf of, of uh, the West. But he said to, um, uh, Obama said to Merkel, you know, that man just lies to me all the time. I, I, I just can't do this. I, you handle it, Angela. <laughs> and so she was stiff. Wow, so she was really stepping into the void as early as that. As early as that. That's very interesting. Yes. 2014, she, she basically, at that point, she became not only the leader, not only the chancellor of Germany and of Europe, but, but of the West. Hmm. Well, I want to take one um, more uh, quickly step back before we leave the question of sort of the female approach to power. One of the, one of the things that you say in the book that was really striking to me in understanding her was that the German chancellor doesn't actually have all that much federal power. Germany, if you know, students of Germany are well aware that they restructured themselves as a very weak federation. And so it's all um, negotiation. It's all uh, persuasion. And, and that's a very different, um, that's a very different style from some of the other uh, the weak, the weak, the chancellor is a remarkably weak executive, and and um, I just want to say, Amy, that it isn't that the Germans restructured themselves; it's we, the Allies, the victors of the Second World War. We were the midwife of the German Constitution, which which is responsible for this diffuse. Uh, executive uh, power with between the lenders and the and the coalition um, uh, uh, building that's required to to form the executive. So her power is um, is is much more in the in in uh, the foreign policy um, because that really is in her hands and and also um, her moral influence now is is so is so great you know. 16 years without a breath of scandal mm -hmm. it's, I mean just think about that for a minute in today's world she she um, when she left the chancellery a few weeks ago she went right back to her rent control department which actually she never <laughs> left and uh, no one ha no one has ever been invited to that apartment by the way and even even during you know COVID times when she was doing uh, Zoom conferences, there was not a single personal item that you could that you could see. As we, you know, I see your books, you see mine. Um, uh, nothing. So that was her her private lair and her her country house in quotation marks. You know, wouldn't wouldn't pass as a as a guest cottage in a Hamptons manse. Mm -hmm. um, so the modesty of the of the lifestyle, the mm -hmm. fact that she always did her own grocery shopping, 
Um, I mean, you know, the, the most powerful leader in, in Europe, um, seen weekly pushing her, her shopping cart. I have a picture um, in my book of her do, during COVID, uh, the first COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she really was magnificent uh, in, the, in the early days of, of, of COVID in, in, in calming the country. And, uh, and, and, and in urging people not to hoard. And, and so the next day she was pictured uh, pushing her cart, which had uh, as many bottles of wine as rolls of toilet paper, <laughs> four, <laughs> four of each. So, you know, she, she doesn't just talk the talk, she, she walks the walk. And I, I've seen her actually shop as most people who hang out in Berlin a lot. I've, I've seen her shop for shoes because, because she, um, you know, she figured out, she was so appalled at the outset how much attention was paid to her, to her appearance because she, she's always been, you know, this very, I think, very appealingly natural, uh, non-fussy, uh, slightly androgynous uh, appearing person. But suddenly, you know, people were writing stories about, you know, how, how uh, shabby she looks. And, uh, and so she, she got rid of that uh, story by, by um, getting a, um, a Hamburg-based uh, designer to, to design a kind of a, the Merkel uniform, which is her, her, um, her, her version of a man's, uh, you know, pinstripe suit, um, is, uh, is jewel-colored, jewel-toned jackets, black pants, black flats. And I literally once saw her um, buying uh, her, her signature black flats Mm. Uh, while her security kind of uh, uh, attempted to blend into the to the uh, department store uh, wall, um, six pairs she bought of identical <laughs> shoes. All the same. Yeah, yeah. So, well, they, but she's very womanly. I mean, it's you know, I interviewed a lot of men who interact with her, uh, fellow heads of state, and they all say that you know, there's nothing that that she's she's womanly. She and and that she doesn't. You play the the sort of um, one one head of state said she's not like Golda Meir who plays you know the cozy grandma. Uh, when when you're dealing with Merkel, you're just dealing with a non-gendered great leader. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was she, from the mm -hmm. Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, who said that. That takes some very careful code code breaking and code and coding recoding so yeah. just to touch briefly one before we leave this question about i mean that must you're talking sort of about her her fundamental um sort of modesty and decency and that yeah. sort of goes back to the question of the moral center yeah. um oh. as a as an east german as a former east german she took very different um lessons about world war ii from um Yes, from say West Germans. I mean, can you talk a little bit about how she was with Israel and how she and it goes? It, it connects with the refugee move, I think. Absolutely, so well put. So, so the East Germans had their own mythology about the Holocaust, uh, which was that that was the West's problem. We were the good Germans. We were the resistance, mm -hmm. and the, as many communists died as 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 Jews in Germany. I mean, total fiction, and um, Merkel. Who was raised with uh, the Bible? She knows the Bible the way most kids know, you know, Grimm's fairy tales. She knows every character. Um, she had to learn about the Holocaust uh, on her own and in, in adulthood. And there were I interviewed the people who were who were her her kind of tutors in that. And because she she was such a a, a profoundly a woman of faith i would say I, I was about to say profoundly religious but but for her religion is a very private matter but she was the first chancellor uh german chancellor to to address the knesset uh, and at this at this uh speech uh which she partly uh she she attempted to to speak hebrew at the at the in the introduction and the conclusion um, she said that the that the well-being and the survival of Israel is a foundational a raison d'etre for today's Germany. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a pretty that's astonishing remarkable. statement, mm -hmm. and uh, no no other German German um, uh, uh, chancellor had ever, had ever so connected Germany's reason for existence to to maintaining. Um, Israel's uh, uh, security. So she is a, I would say she, 
she's a philo semite her, one of her closest friends who uh, was very helpful to me was a former Israeli ambassador to, to Germany who retired there in Berlin. So I was able to see him on my, hmm. and, uh, and he, he was one who, who um, his name is Shimon Stein and he's, I often quote him in the book. He, he, was, he was one of her sort of guides through the Holocaust. One of her final uh, uh, visits before before locked before COVID lockdown in um, in in late uh, 2019 was to Auschwitz, which she had been to all the German concentration camps, but she'd never been to this most uh, horrific uh, of all uh, all of them. And uh, gave a uh, uh, as I've said, she's not a great she's not a gifted uh, speaker, but this was a deeply moving speech because because so full of her, of her own sense that Germany's responsibility toward the Jews is without time limit and mm -hmm. is, is permanent. And if you were to ask her that, that is Germany now a normal nation, her answer would be yes, but. The but being as long as Germans acknowledge their permanent responsibility and here's the problem today. A large segment of the East German population did not go through this, this uh, hard work of processing Germany's darkest chapter the way the West has. It took them quite a while, but, but they've done a better job than I think any other country in Europe. Um, the East Germans have, did not go through that because of that mythology of we're the good Germans. Um, and as a result, it, it is the East Germans who are susceptible to right-wing extremism today. It is in East Germany that the Alternative für Deutschland, the uh, far-right party, which is now in the, pardon the expression, Bundestag, uh, for the first time since since the Second World War, there's now a, a, a far right party in in the Bund in the parliament. Um, but but let me just say that the good news is that rather than uh, increasing their numbers, they are the numbers are shrinking. Which is not to say that their presence uh, isn't a blot, and that their presence isn't also. Uh, a product, a child of the Merkel era. So this was one of the, uh, the things I, I, I refer to as, as Merkel's blind spot is that because she's so hyper-rational, mm -hmm. she underestimates the role of the irrational in other, in, 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 in the, most of our thinking. And, and therefore she thought that East Germans, well, I mean, she dusted herself off and, and restarted her engine when the wall came down, you know, brilliant. Why can't they? Why can't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, well yeah. T talk a little more about her legacy, if you, in, in that sense. I mean, not just her legacy in holding back the tide of this sort of right-wing populism in Germany, but in a way, I mean, you describe her as kind of the, the last in some ways, is she the last gasp of the Western liberal order? I mean, how do oh, we? Gosh, really... I hope not. I hope not. Yeah, but but she she certainly uh, held back the tide and transformed her country in, in her very quiet way. It's a different country today, and I would I would predict that Germany would be the last country in Europe to to fall for um, populism, because and of her. and she, yeah, and and she. She played a big role in that through her moral example and through her her um, her anti nationalism. You know, when she was when she was once asked, "What do you love about your homeland?" Um, it, it, wonderful, typical, dry. Because we haven't mentioned that she has a killer sense of humor. This was one of the treats of my research: is collecting her bon mot. Um, but she said, um, "Well, we have very nice draft proof." windows I mean, <laughs> so she's the yeah she just wasn't gonna go there she wasn't gonna say ah oh, you know i love uh, no flag I, no beer yeah, right, no right beer. yes no, no yeah yeah no, really nobody's better yeah. yeah no no we have we have good good draft proof windows uh i mean it was a it was a 
you know, a, a, a witty line, but, but um, she's, she's, a, she's not an idealist, Amy. She, she does not believe that the, that the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice. She is too clear eyed about that. Um, and, you know, having profoundly studied um, the Holocaust and, and, and the capacity of this civilized, so-called civilized nation to, to become the most uncivilized in, mm -hmm. in a matter of years. Um, she, she, she well understands humans' capacity for, for, uh, for evil, but she believes in the quiet work of, of everyday uh, salvation. And I, you know, to have had a leader like that for, for 16 years, and a leader who, um, who didn't just talk about it, in fact, didn't talk about it at all, but <laughs> who, <laughs> I wish she had, um, but who, uh, who demonstrated that, yes, we can make room for people who are different from us, who, who look different, who, who worship a different uh, God, who, who, um, need to learn our, our language, uh, but who are desperate because, mm -hmm. because that's what the Judeo-Christian ethos is about. And, um, you know, the way she confronted, I mean, her toughest um, relationship was, of course, with Donald Trump, mm -hmm. because, because um, she, uh, she reveres our country. And uh, perhaps more than any other chancellor. I mean, she had in her office a, 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 a picture of, uh, of the elder President Bush, as well as of Ronald Reagan, because to her, those were the giants of the Cold War who, who enabled um, the unification of Germany and who enabled her second Right, her, liberated like, her personally, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So it was, um, it was quite a shock for her that, <laughs> that America chose this man, Donald Trump, but um, she, she was advised by her many Republican friends to practice strategic patience. Well, that didn't work out that well. You, you but, have this great line. I don't want, I want you to go on with this, but you have this great yeah. line where you say she spoke to him in a low lion tamer's tone. <laughs> <laughs> and that she somehow actually managed to calm him down occasionally. He liked listening to her, he said, right? Yes, that's what, yeah. Uh, I interviewed uh, one of Trump's uh, foreign policy aides, Fiona Hill, who's wonderful. Uh, and, and, and Fiona said, yes, um, Trump actually was quite, charmed by her because first of all it's better than reading position papers and and uh, she she does uh she is she is very impressive and never raises her voice mm -hmm. and and uh, you know unlike some others doesn't seem to be trying too hard he you know he he disses people who, who look like they're breaking a sweat and trying to impress him she, she never did and uh, I, you know, I, I have this this other photograph in the book, which I think is a, a picture that speaks a, a thousand words, where where she's surrounded by by her fellow EU heads of state, and and Trump is sitting down, you know, a typical Trumpian, you know, jut jut jawed expression, you know, like make me, uh, he seems to be saying, and and she's leaning in, uh, and all the other guys, all men, are leaning back. <laughs> and it, it's such a you know it just that's the way it was and she breathed an enormous sigh of relief mm -hmm. when when biden won the election mm -hmm. but two things uh she was horrified by january 6 the storming of mm -hmm. of the capitol and uh and in a way her faith in in us mm. has been has been permanently shaken. And the way she uh, expressed that was that when Biden, um, uh, after Biden was elected, um, the Biden um, folks asked her not to make a big deal with China, uh, a trade deal that, that, um, that she'd been working on, because she has made more trips to Beijing than any other head of state. She, she, China uh, has been on her radar for her entire uh, political life because again she could see that this nation was ascended mm -hmm. russia was not russia was the 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 troublemaker right. but china was the real threat anyway um so so uh the biden team asked her to hold back let's do this together 
let's mm -hmm. let's make a deal a, a favorable trade deal on behalf of uh of all of us and sure. and no yeah. she went ahead as a signal that you guys are no longer sitting at the head of the table and we're going to work with you of course but you're no longer calling you're no longer the ceo of the west as mm -hmm. it were do you think that's a permanent shift <laughs> Well, uh, what is permanent? I, I think we have to. I think we have to, uh, you know, pr demonstrate mm -hmm. that we are worthy of trust. And and of course, uh, she who knows history so well knows the power of a big lie because it was the it was the big lie that brought Hitler to power. You know, the lie that the Jews um, and the communists stabbed Germany in the back uh, that lost World War One. That that was Hitler's ticket to. The chancellery and and um, Trump may be gone, but Trumpism is not gone, and she is well aware of that. So, um, I, but you know, she's she's uh, she she loved. I, I I'm sure that as soon as she's able, she will travel in America because she there's so many things she wants to see, which she she was never able to see. I mean, she's she's free for the first time in her life. When you think about it. 35 right. years under under uh, a, a police state and then 16 <laughs> chancellor what do you think she'll oh. do with the rest of her life well i think she's uh she's deserved a a, a break she is, it, you know yeah. um and and i think she's she's uh, she was offered a big job at, uh by the un secretary general um but a week before last and she turned it down i was not surprised i don't think there's a job in the world that she would take. I mean, after being chancellor of Germany, you know, please. But um, um, it was it was a job having to do with 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 environment and, and climate, which is very much um, an, uh, an unfinished business for her. She was going to um, in her in her New Year's address. It's a one time a year when she when she would address the nation. Um, she in in um, on January 1st, 2020, she announced that that now she was going to focus on climate. Mm. And and of course, six weeks later, COVID hit and she became, it, it was her, her um, final crisis uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in 16 years of a rolling crisis. I mean, it never let up. The financial crisis, the refugee crisis, Putin, one thing after another, right? And she somehow yeah. made, as you write how she goes, she bests them one one by one. She does by by never taking the bait and uh, never, um, you know, getting down and dirty, just just persisting, pretends. One of her, uh, actually her ambassador to Washington, wonderful uh, ambassador, um, Haber, um, said that the, the way she reduces her, the, the guy across the table that she's negotiating with, let's say Putin, um, is that she repeats what they've just said in, you know, grand, uh, grandiloquent, uh, you know, hot air. Uh, she, she repeats it in, in an almost childlike manner. So you want um, all the territory from here to the Himalayas? Did I understand you know yeah, I mean, <laughs> right taking the air out <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah. It makes them makes them feel extremely foolish uh <laughs> and which is her point right. um you know just reduces everything to its simplest mm -hmm. common denominator and then works from there um it's uh and, and is always the last one to leave the table i mean the the other thing which i haven't mentioned uh in her toolkit is her remarkable physical stamina you know she can uh, like with like during the first ukraine war um negotiations which she led she said sometimes the only way she could tell the time of day at the table was whether they were serving bread and jam or a roast so that level of focus you know again going back to her scientists training of the ability to 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 um, to block out everything else and just focus focus, um, and people were falling asleep at that table, um, and <laughs> she, she was still there working for you know an inch of territory, um, 
And I, I honestly, who, who, who in the West is going to do that? But, but let me just say that that among the, you know, I said that she transformed her country, and I, I, I didn't mean to just just be glib about that. She transformed the country in very real ways. She made marriage equality the law of the land. She opened up tremendous space for women, obviously. Um, and, and, um, and, and of course, uh, Germany now is uh, the moral center of Europe, not only the financial and economic. I mean, that's pretty big. As, as, as the kids say now, that wasn't really on the bingo card. You know? No. <laughs> we weren't expecting that. No, no. So she leaves a transformed uh, country. And, and I think, you know, when Churchill was asked, uh, will history be kind to me? He said, yes, because I intend to write it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think she will. I don't think she will write it. But uh, because she, first of all, it's, it's just not we'll her write thing. It. <laughs> yeah, I've already done it for You've her. You've written it. She doesn't there have to. Is. Here we go. Um, so. uh, uh, but but uh, I think history will be uh, very generous with her because because of because of all these all these things that that and I think that that even those Germans who who you know were ready for uh, for uh, Muti as she is derisively still called mommy um, uh, now see as the uh, that she leaves an enormous vacuum because you know look at them struggling with. Uh, in, in Ukraine and look at them struggling with, you know, trying to balance their energy needs yeah. with, with, uh, with Russia's uh, looming, looming threat and the possibility of Russia using oil and gas as blackmail. Yeah. Uh, she knew how to, she, she, you know, she kept, she kept the West together and, and I don't know, I don't know who's going to do that now. Wow. Well, we don't want to, <laughs> I, I know you wanted to leave room for questions, but we don't want to end on such, a, such an alarming no, no, note. No, no. What me, a great example. <laughs> right, right. Well, let me take to be, to be, um, um, on the, on, I know, I know you wanted to answer questions and on the plus side, I think looking at the queue, we've answered, you've answered quite a few of them already, um, as, as we've gone, but I do want to just quickly ask you to take a step back and, um, say a, say a thing or two about your own background. And you, you mentioned at various times in, mm -hmm. in the narrative, how you feel a kind of a kinship with Merkel. You too grew up at least for a while, you know, partly under, and uh, you know, and, and behind the iron curtain and you experienced the, 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 the the Cold War and the the secret police. Mm -hmm. um, you have you you do a lot of this in footnotes, which I think is is fun. <laughs> I, I I commend everyone to your foot footnotes. But um, to, can you say talk a little bit about how um, what she does she mean what does she mean to you personally? Has she oh, you know um, yeah. inspired you in any way or politically? Well, thank you, and I hope I didn't overdo the footnotes because not at all. They're really, hilarious. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. I mean, there were there were just times when 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 I did recall uh, incidents from my own childhood in in communist Hungary, and I was the child of political prisoners, uh, and she was uh, my my parents were among the last independent journalists, so they were jailed when I was six. And I commend I, everyone her your last book, by the way. People should if they if they somehow missed her last book about her parents, you should read that too. Of, Enemies of the People, which she read. And I think that helped me. Uh, you know, not that she would ever say, but um, but you know, she uh, you know, I was I was in and out of the chancellery a lot during these past years, and she never she never, you know, sat down and, and opened up because that is not her way. Um, but uh, she had to have known that I was speaking to her very small inner circle of advisors. And, and uh, I, I think there, yeah, we, we, we do have our foundation in common. And she also, I have to say, liked my late husband, Richard Holbrook, which didn't hurt. They, 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 they started off, uh, as Richard often did, on a kind of a, a teasing uh, note. We, we, we had dinner, Richard and I, with, with uh, the then Minister Merkel, and who was then Minister for, for Women and Youth, and, and Richard teased her and said, you don't really care about women and youth, do you? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you kidding here? <laughs> and she got a little uh, defensive. But then when, when many years later, she's now chancellor and I'm now 
um, Richard's widow and working on the book. Uh, she um, she uh, caught my uh, attention in a, at an event at the chancellery and she said, you know, I was very fond of Richard. And that was so nice. Um, so, so I think I had that um, as, a, as a tiny little Mm -hmm. advantage but mostly the the uh I, I i it's not an exaggeration to say that she changed the way i think and approach things mm -hmm. because uh, i tend to be more impulsive and and i i i, I really try to to uh you know curb my both my enthusiasm and my and my temper you know in a way that she does because um, she she had a, a little a plexiglass cube on her desk, which which said, "In in calm there is strength," hmm. and and I had I had one of those made for myself too. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. So we are we are actually we're going to run out of time pretty soon. I promised I'd uh, ask you about your own personal um, attempt to fight the, the rise of populism in your yeah. effort to, about against yeah. Jeff Orban. But it's gotta be quick because you do wanna answer questions. I do, I do. But but let me just say that there's a crucial election uh, which might be Hungary's last chance to to um, to re uh, to rescue democracy um, from the populism of uh, uh, the nationalist ethnic populism of, of Viktor Orban um, on April 3rd. And I'm trying, I've never done anything like this. I'm not a political activist. I'm a writer, but but I, I'm 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 trying to uh, rally the Hungarian expatriate community to, insofar as they're able to, to uh, some of them can vote, and and certainly they they in, in the global media echo chamber they can they can be heard because in Hungary Orban controls ninety percent of the media, so it's very there's a very solid um, opposition now. Uh, running against him for the first time, a, a, a good guy who has a very good shot. And, and so I'm trying to, um, I, not that I want to ever move back to Hungary, but I, I was formerly very proud of my, of my uh, homeland. I, I'm uh, not so proud of it in, in, its, in its present incarnation. And I would like to be proud again. And I would like for my Hungarian friends to have the freedoms that that I thought were theirs after after the Soviets uh, withdrew in 19, 1991. Um, and Orban is a huge, huge disappointment um, to many of us. He's, he's taking the country backward, not forward. So Kati, I would I would like to talk all day about Angela Merkel and you, and this has been lovely. But I'm gonna let Suzanne and the uh, the many many listeners have a crack. So thank, thank you, you so much, and I just can't say enough good about this book. Thank you, Amy. It's been such a pleasure. I, yeah. So we have to continue this on our own. Yes. yes <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you much. both. I know this could, could go on and on. Um, if you don't mind, we'll maybe take just a couple extra minutes, um, go over just a few minutes to get to some of these questions. Um, first, people would like to know, does she have siblings? Um, her husband, does anybody have other influences um, in her life? Yes, absolutely. But, but, but again, Suzanne, um, neither of her siblings have ever given an interview. Uh, about their famous sister, her parents certainly never did. But um, of course, uh, there are there are uh, other influences. Her husband is an important influence. He's a distinguished scientist. Again, um, never never opened up about about uh, Merkel. Um, but um, you know, part of part of the secret of her of her stamina is that she's got this whole other. Uh, uh, life that she preserved for herself. She was not sort of public property. I think I, I think politicians can learn from that. You know, preserve a piece of yourself for yourself. And she's she's done that, and her family has has been very much a part of that. Mm -hmm. her, her husband is her is her um, confidant for sure. Great. Uh, what was the ch chancellor's relationship with other female presidents and prime ministers from around the world? And I'll add on to that another question about did she serve as a mentor for women in German politics? You know, uh, she she likes to say that she's the chancellor of all Germans, um, not particularly uh, women. 
Uh, but And she considers her example to be her strongest advocacy for women. And I think she's right. But she has surrounded herself with powerful women. So uh, she, she has a, a, a kind of a kitchen cabinet of three. And two of the three are women. Uh, so her closest advisors are women. The president of the um, European Union, the European Council, as it's called, is is a um, is a woman, Ursula von der Leyen, who was her protege. Um, and I can tell you from my brief interaction, she really likes women. You know, Mar Margaret Thatcher did not. Margaret Thatcher, you know, would rather be caught dead than photographed next to a woman. Um, I exaggerate only slightly, never had a woman in her cabinet. Um, so um, she, she um, also made it the law of the land to have, to have um, X number of women on every board. And uh, so she didn't just, uh, she, she, she didn't leave it at, at, her, at her symbolic uh, gestures. She, she actually moved the needle in, in, uh, in legal ways as well. It's it's just not a it's just not a just like just like uh, refugees uh, have been accepted um, by a, a, a previously homogeneous culture. Women are now in 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 the uh, Bundestag in in large numbers in large numbers. Thank you. How did she move from science to politics so quickly? What was the tra trajectory before her mentorship from um, Cole? So she um, actually chose science uh, as a safe place to park her brain under uh, the police state because it's, it's tougher to manipulate science and facts than, than any other field. So the minute um, the, the wall came down and, uh, you know, possibilities opened up, she took off her la white lab coat and went looking for a party, a political party um, that, that suited her. And uh, and quickly found one in that in that uh, in the ferment of the uh, of the post-communist uh, Berlin, and uh, and then rose rapidly through all by using all the skills that we've been talking about, her her capacity to shield her ambition, bide her time, uh, observe and learn, and uh, win the trust of those around her. And when she saw an opening, she went for it. I, I, I just want to insert that her, her entry into politics is typical. She saw um, at this sort of political startup that, that, that she was exploring in her neighborhood, she saw a bunch of boxes in a corner, unopened crates. And, uh, and she rolled up her sleeves, opened the boxes, and they were computers, gifts from, who knows, George Soros. Um, and she assembled them and wow, nobody else, <laughs> nobody else knew how to do that. So next time she came back, she was offered a seat at the table. So what do you think, I mean, you've spoken about this a little bit before, but what was it about her that both, uh, Putin and Trump didn't just dismiss her, that they took her seriously and respected her? Uh, her brilliance her, her um, knowledge of uh, every tree on the ground in Ukraine. She would go into those, those sessions knowing precisely what the Russian militia had done the night before. So no, she, nobody, nobody can blow hot air at her because she knows too much. Um, and and she is, uh, she's extraordinarily uh, calm doesn't take the bait when, when Trump, for example, uh, fished out a, a Starburst candy from his pocket at, at, uh, at one um, uh, NATO conference and tossed it at her um, to, the, to the shock of all the other heads of state. She, she pretended she didn't notice. So doesn't take the bait, supremely controlled ego. It was never about her, always about getting the job done. Um, she, you know, Germans found a politician, a leader who could focus on them, not on herself. And, and that, you know, think about how rare, how rare that is. The controlled ego, I would say, uh, was, was her primary um, 
among her many gifts. Mm -hmm. And did Merkel think that Putin's involvement in Syria might have been calculated and that the migration of Syrians into Europe would unhinge European democracy? Um, well, um, Merkel was, was um, of course, appalled by, by the, the, uh, what happened in, in, in the Syrian civil war, and, but was opposed to, um, uh, to um, engaging militarily with, with Assad, um, because she, she, although she's not a pacifist, she um, thinks that that um, once once armies engage, um, it, the 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 law of unintended consequences kicks in and and you uncontrolled and, and that it, that represents a failure of diplomacy. She of course knows that Putin is his his entire uh, the thing that keeps him uh, going is is trying to disrupt the West. Uh, sowing the seeds of of uh, of, of, uh, of dissent and and disun disunity in in NATO in the West as he's now doing, um, but um, what happened in in Syria, it was was uh, really really a, a catastrophic failure of of uh, pretty much the entire region. I mean, where 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 does one even begin? I mean, uh, you know, uh, Assad Assad is, is turned out to be a monster who was who was prepared to uh, to to uh, fight to the last Syrian to maintain himself in in power, and uh, it was a good it was a good chance for for Putin to exploit that. But it was as he always does, as he exploits. Uh, any any situation because his ultimate goal is to is to not only to disrupt the West but to restore the grandeur that was Russia, i.e., the Soviet Empire. Uh, he wants to be uh, at the table with the big boys. And and when when uh, President Obama referred to him uh, referred to Russia as a regional player, wow, that was deeply disturbing to Putin. Mm -hmm. And what do you think of over the last 16 years, her lasting legacy will be? If you had to pick one or two. I transformed Germany. Okay. <laughs> Is that good enough? Yes. Uh, a, a more liberal, more open, more moral, um, more um, uh, welcoming to women and welcoming to, um, to those in need. The mm -hmm. one million from from the wars that Germany did not start, we had mm -hmm. a much bigger role in Iraq, Afghanistan. And, and what do you think is the uh, biggest lesson for aspiring politicians that they can learn from her? Mm. Um, listen, learn, observe, keep your ego in check. It's not about you. You are a public servant. You work for us, not the other way around. Uh, we will trust and reelect you if you keep us in 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 your in focus rather than looking at the mirror and admiring what you see great advice uh thank you very much but what the lastly uh before we go what is next for you do you have any books on the horizon um, oh god that's like asking a person who just gave birth so <laughs> 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 so uh, I'm happy to say, Suzanne, that this book has been translated into 16 languages. Congratulations! So I am. I am. This. This was. This was the most fun Zoom call of them all. <laughs> I have to say, but I'm doing a whole lot of Zoom calls with a whole lot of places that I. Some of them I have to look up on the map. Um, so, so including Russian and Chinese, and I'm happy to say my my native Hungarian, Korean. And so on. So, uh, so sixteen versions of of the chancellor. So, I think I'm going to be a busy girl for. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. Great. Right. Well, well, Kati, Amy, thank you so much. I want to thank the audience for joining us as well. I will be sending out an email later in the week that will include a link to Kati's book that you can. I guess in a sense, pre-order and until more copies are printed. Um, and be sure to register at momentmag.com for next week's uh, Zoominar on Black Jewish relations. And again, thank you both for this wonderful conversation and we will see everybody next time.
Take care. Thank so much. Thank, Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much, Thank Kathy. You. I hope we'll continue. <laughs> Great to talk to Great you guys. Bye-bye. Good luck Bye. with it.